Welcome to the inaugural edition of Roundtable Prime, hosted by Double Line CEO Jeffrey Gunlack. Six thought leaders in today's financial markets will discuss their take on the economy and their outlook for the financial markets. Roundtable Prime will divide the discussion into three segments. This opening segment, first filmed January 6, 2020, covers the global macro economy. The Roundtable guests, with decades in the financial markets, are recognized leaders in macroeconomic analysis, market research, and investment management. They bring together a broad array in different sectors of the financial markets, including government fixed income, credit, equities, real estate, and commodities. All have been sought after for their insights as speakers and as commentators in the financial media. And now, Double Line is pleased to introduce the honored guests of Roundtable Prime, our moderator and our host. Jeffrey Sherman will moderate today's discussions. Jeffrey Sherman is Deputy Chief Investment Officer of Double Line Capital and a portfolio manager of a number of Double Line's fixed income and derivatives-based strategies. He also hosts the Sherman Show podcast series, which has featured many of today's distinguished guests. Ed Hyman is chairman of Evercore ISI, where he heads the economic research team. For the past 44 years, Ed has been ranked by Institutional Investor Poll of Investors for Economics and ranked number one for 39 years. Ed Hyman is highly regarded for his origination of econometric modeling and real-time surveys to gain insight into the unfolding business and market cycles. James Bianco is president and macro strategist at Bianco Research, which he established with the aim of originating insights unencumbered by traditional Wall Street research. His commentaries address such diverse subjects as monetary policy, the intersection of markets and politics, fund flows, and asset allocation. Jeffrey Gundlach, host of Roundtable Prime, is founder and CEO of Double Line Capital, an investment manager with investment strategies in fixed income, equity, real estate, and commodities. In 2012, 2015, and 2016, he was named to Bloomberg Magazine's 50 Most Influential. In 2017, he was inducted into the FIASI Fixed Income Hall of Fame. Stephen Romick is a managing partner and portfolio manager at Los Angeles-based First Pacific Advisors. He is the founding portfolio manager of the FPA Crescent Fund, as well as other funds. Since 1993, FPA Crescent's goal has been to generate equity-like returns over the long term, take less risk than the market, and avoid permanent impairment of capital. Among other awards and nominations, he and his co-portfolio managers were named Morningstar's U.S. Allocation Fund Manager of the Year in 2013. Danielle DiMartino Booth is CEO and Chief Strategist for Quill Intelligence, a research and analytics firm whose commentary appears in the Daily Feather and the Weekly Quill. Prior to Quill, she served throughout the credit crisis as advisor to Richard Fisher, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. She is author of Fed Up, an insider's take on why the Fed is bad for America. David Rosenberg is Chief Economist and Strategist of Rosenberg Research and Associates, an economic consulting firm providing analysis and insights to help investors make well-informed decisions. Prior to founding the firm, he was Chief Economist and Strategist at Gluskin Chef and Associates. From 2002 to 2009, he held those positions at Merrill Lynch in New York, where he was consistently ranked in the Institutional Investor All-Star Analysis Rankings. Jeffrey Sherman, Deputy Chief Investment Officer of Double Line, will now open the first of three segments of Roundtable Prime. All right, welcome everybody, and thanks for uh, coming to our first annual Roundtable Prime hosted here at the Double Line headquarters in Los Angeles. Uh, I want to start off talking about the macroeconomic environment. And so I think we'd be remiss if we didn't start talking about central banks to start. And so we look back on 2019, it was characterized as a year in which there was coordinated easing really across the, the globe uh, from central bankers, at least in the developed world. Some started with their easing policies, some had a continuation, some such as the Fed um, initiated a pivot from a, a hawkish stance to this easing stance. So let's start off and talk about 2020 and what that will hold. So maybe David, I'll start with you. Uh, what do you think is in the cards for the central banks? Uh, let's start with the Fed, the ECB, perhaps the BOJ, and think about what will transpire in 2020. Well, it's a, it's a great question, uh, and uh, the way I would answer it is this. When you talked about the tightening cycle, it was really just one central bank, and it was the Fed. I mean, the ECB uh, was on hold, and actually de facto easing policy through its balance sheet, the BOJ the same. 
Uh, I think that the Bank of England in the whole cycle raised rates once under Mark Carney. So it was really just about the Fed. Um, when we're looking at what's going to happen in the coming year, I think all the central banks are going to remain extremely accommodative. Uh, my sense is that although the Fed would probably not like to have to ease policy, and of course they're premising it on their current rosy economic outlook, I think that rosy economic outlook is going to be challenged. Uh, and I think that the, the biggest stress test is going to be whether or not the U.S. consumer, which was resilient last year, in the face of weakness in almost every other part of the economy, is going to remain resilient. Uh, so my sense is that the economy is going to be weak, the output gap is going to widen, deflationary pressures are going to intensify, and these central banks globally are going to remain extremely accommodative and find different ways to ease policy further. Well, your nickname's Rosie, so is it fair to say that's the rosy economic outlook? If you're, if you're, if you're, if you're long zero coupon bonds, then it's a very rosy scenario. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Danielle, same question to you. Um, your experience with the Fed, what, what do you think is in, in store for the Fed this year? So I, I think what investors have to appreciate is that Jay Powell has completely broken with precedent. Um, Alan Greenspan was famous in 1996 for giving a speech about irrational exuberance. He chose to do nothing about it. He could have raised margin requirements at the time. He made several speeches that said you can only address a bubble in its aftermath, which prompted Jim Grant to say his famously say the Fed is both arsonist and firefighter. Um, and Bernanke and Yellen held that same philosophy throughout their tenures when they were running the Fed. Jay Powell's broken with that completely. Um, when credit markets seized up in late 2018, he is somebody who understands duration. He's somebody who understands the, the, the full credit spectrum. And he grasped the magnitude of underlying assets not trading in exchange-traded bond funds. I mean, that's kind of in the weeds, but I, I just want to make the point that Jay Powell understood what was going on and the feedback mechanism, how it could transmit back into the stock market via arrested share buybacks. So he has chosen to break with his predecessors and try and get out in front of credit volatility, keep it contained at all costs. And as we're discovering, that is backing him into a very big corner because the only thing being debated right now on Wall Street is how big the Fed's balance sheet is going to get. I think there is a presumption in the market that we're going to surpass $4.5 trillion fairly quickly and that there will be there'll be pressure on Jay Powell to continue growing that balance sheet in addition to the fact that the, these fresh geopolitical tensions have put rate cuts back on the table if you look at bond market probabilities. So I think we have a very easy Fed unwillingly. I, I don't think that, that Powell wants to be seen as, as helping the presidential election in any way, shape, or form, but that's not where his focus is. His focus is on credit market volatility. That's it. Well, it's interesting you brought up credit market volatility. And I think back to the fourth quarter of last year, and what we had there was the credit markets freezing up. But then, uh, I'm sorry, I said last year. I meant 2018. Right. I'm, I haven't switched to 2020 yet. <laughs> uh, but it's when you go back decade. to the fourth quarter of 18, um, the the market was freezing up, right? We saw that the high yield market didn't even uh, allow an days. issue, right? 41 For 41 re days, the, yeah. A record, yes. So if he isn't flying that, why did he continue to hike rates during that that period of time? So maybe Jim, maybe you could uh, give your insight there. Why did Powell continue to press the rate hikes back in 2018 and continue the unwinding of the balance sheet at that point in time? Because he was new and he was not a PhD. And I think he was trying to take what was already established with the Fed and continue it. I think that if Powell had a problem early on, it was a lot of the talk that you got out of him 2018 after he became uh, the chairman was him expressing what the general consensus view of the Fed was, not his personal view. I think subsequent to that, now that we're into 2020, he's now more talking about what he thinks and less more and less about what he thought that the rest of the, uh, uh, the crowd thought. I also think he got consumed by the Fed staff. You know, that they, they, they came in with um, all the quants and they gave him the models and they told him that this was the predictions and stuff. And he was like, okay, if that's what we're saying, then I'll just take that flag and I'll go with it. And I think he's now changed a little bit that he'll listen to them and respect it, but then he'll he'll interject his own voice in there. Yeah. So speaking of models, Jeffrey, you were critical of uh, Mr. Powell. I think it was the September of 2018. I got to get that number right. To September 2018 press conference where you said he started talking like an economist and he was referencing models and our star once again. Um, has he learned from that experience? And what do you expect to, to get garner from uh, Mr. Powell this year as leading the Fed? I, I think Jay Powell has gotten to a mode where he 
wants to say as little as possible. I think he, when he started, he seemed to me to have a framework in his head, particularly in the fourth quarter of 2018. And the market was by uh, pretty uh, degrees and fairly consistently rejecting his framework. If you remember in the fourth quarter of 2018, as Danielle said, the, the high yield bond market was, was closed. They couldn't float an issue for basically two months of trading days. And Jay Powell, as, as the stock market was down into a full bear market territory, it was down 20% plus, uh, he w got, uh, got in front of the podium in December of 2018, and he reiterated his multiple rate hikes, quantitative tightening, kind of a framework that the market had already completely rejected as a sound policy. And subsequent to that press conference, he was struggled for six months to put back-to-back -back press conference messaging together that was at all consistent with the one prior. And it kind of shamed him into following the bond market. And so we ended up basically uh, watching the WARP function, the world interest rate prediction function that you can get on Bloomberg. And basically, it seems to me that he's just following the market at this point. And the market has had been uh, kind of leading the Fed but now, both the Fed's idea of being on hold, which is their strong desire, like you know, do no harm, sort of the Hippocratic oath for, the, for, for Jay Powell, job number one, do no harm. So I think he, what he's looking to do is to hope things hang together and to be able to go, get through 2020 with rates pretty much on hold the entire year. And the bond market has ratified that point of view. I mean, the two-year Treasury yield is very consistent with the Fed funds rate being unchanged for quite some time. So I, I think that that's what he's going to do. Now, what I really find curious is Jay Powell did not understand really, in my, in my opinion, what was happening in the credit market dynamic in 2018. And he also failed to predict the dust up in the repo market, September 17th of 2019. And I find that to be a little bit disconcerting that they say, well, in retrospect, we can see that there was some pressure on the, the repo funding because there was a mismatch in the maturing bills versus newly issued bills, and we had tax payments in the middle of September. But both of those variables are completely known. It's not like something happened that they dropped out of the sky. You knew the tax payments were going to be due September 17th, and you knew what the maturity schedule was in the TVL market. So I, 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 I keep scratching my head as to why the repo market uh, was, was rejecting the Fed funds rate at that time when the yield curve was inverted and the highest rate out there was overnight money. And so I continue to be concerned that when we have larger supply at the long end, that we might see a similar event where the market rejects kind of the, the, the manipulated interest rates. I'd wonder if, Danielle, you know about uh, the, the Fed and their operations. What do you think happened September 17th? And why is that still an issue? Um, so I, I think that, that on a fundamental level, the fact that Jay Powell himself was a, a huge advocate for John Williams taking over at the New York Fed was kind of mistake number one. And then you, you, you had the dismissal, which... Uh, was not very popular internally of the head of the New York Markets Desk, um, something that the media really did not cover adequately. So you have the architect of quantitative easing leave in the middle of negotiations with the government um, on the debt ceiling. So, and you have things like John Williams coming out and making a speech that he actually vetted through his markets desk. They said, don't make the speech. You're going to change market pricing. You're going to imply a 50 basis point rate cut and that's not where you want to go. So you've got the New York, you've got the New York Fed being, you know, there, there was damage control coming out of Washington, DC. The root of it is the fact that there's 
a, a lack of understanding of the operations of the market and of some of the biggest banks and the role that they play and the fact that they've got these tools that they simply don't completely understand how they work. If you're talking about interest on excess reserves or the re reverse repo facility, and Jim is nodding his head because I know that... It's just, that's not very reassuring. I mean. it, it's, it's, not, it's not reassuring, but, it's, it, but it is the fact that, also, that this, this also is a man who didn't have a Bloomberg me, terminal on his desk I, when he was I, in I San Francisco to, Fed. I, 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 I hear different opinions on, on this issue. But also not reassuring to me is the strange comment that expanding the balance sheet through repo, you know, re reserve operations is not quantitative easing. What, what, what do you make of that? Is, well, is it because quantitative easing is only to manipulate this, long this rates? Is a, this is a very deep, deep, deep question that you're asking me. We are in the middle of a political firestorm in this country, and I think that it, it, I think that it is a slippery slope if you veer towards the zero bound um, because you get to talking about about not bailing out the banks, but bailing out the people. And I, Jay Powell is highly aware of not becoming a political tool. If he calls it quantitative easing, then you're effectively back to bailing out the banks. Very, very, very unpopular. You can be recruited by politicians, thus, to print money, to do whatever, X, Y, or Z, universal basic income, Medicare for all, you name it. But that is the slippery slope that he's trying to avoid by calling it not QE or whatever he's saying. It's a technical operation. Look, the United States government issues most of its debt at the short end of the curve, so the Fed is effectively monetizing the debt. There's, there's no question about it. But again, I think it's optics that are driving Jay Powell. And, and Jim can jump in here. Yeah, you know, uh, as far as this whole not QE thing, I think this is uh, an attempt to try and say that we're not manipulating markets, that somehow QE is a market manipulation thing, but we're not manipulating markets. It fits the very definition that Bernanke gave us in 2009 of expansion of the, uh, of the balance sheet through excess uh, bank reserves uh, of, what, of what QE is. And so they're trying to have both things at the same time. I think the real problem, which you touched upon, Danielle, is that they, I think they know what the problem is, and the problem is is that they overregulated the banking system, that if you look at the statistics, there's like a trillion plus of excess reserves. Well, that is effectively zero to negative because we've put so many rules on the banks that while you have an excess reserve, you've got liquidity coverage rules, you've got high quality liquid asset rules, you've got Basel III rules, um, you've got, uh, pretty soon we're gonna have net stable funding rules, we've got GSIB, uh, systemically important bank rules, that you can't do anything with that money. And that's why the banks have been constricted. There was initially some talk by Quarles about, well, maybe we ought to back off on the rules. And then you had Liz Warren come out and say, don't you dare, don't you dare do that. You know, and I quipped, you know, they've already got one president pissed off at them. Let's start working on the next one before they even become president, you know, getting mad at them. And then you had people like Alan Blinder and Sheila Bear just two weeks ago come out and say, don't back off on the rules. And so I think the Fed's problem is, okay, we overregulated the banking system, but nobody wants us to back off the rules. So how do we fix this if we don't back off the rules? And the answer is, we don't know. So we'll just keep throwing money at it every day and with these, with these repo schedules, and we'll go into next week, and we'll go into next week, and we'll figure it out somewhere else down the line. Because it's been four months. Right. Have we heard anything about a long-term solution to this? Nothing. And, and Nothing we're at a record $100 billion a month run rate. Mm -hmm. uh, levels of quantitative easing that were unheard of and unseen when we had QE3 running in, in the background at $85 billion a month. So it, 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 this is the quietest rejection denial that I have ever seen at this institution where I used to call home. One thing that uh, suggests that what they're doing is quantitative easing is the bloodless verdict of the bond market, where, ironically, against most people's intuition, when they do quantitative easing, long rates tend to rise. And it's happened every single time. And when they do quantitative tightening, strangely, long rates tend to fall. It would, it would, your intuition would suggest probably the opposite. Well, if they're putting more bonds into the market with quantitative tightening, that's more supply. Shouldn't rates go? Shouldn't rates go up? And if they're doing quantitative easing, well, aren't they taking bonds out of the market? And shouldn't rates go down? But QE1, QE2, QE3, and whatever this is, QE4, I guess I would call it, exactly the opposite has happened every time. I mean, rates bottomed exactly when they started with this repo facility thing. The bottom in rates was in September, and the repo problem was September 17th. And in response to that, we've now seen the 10-year Treasury go from 144 
up towards 2%. I know it's down about 180 now uh, with, with uh, the geopolitical problems, but uh, it's, it really is interesting that the market, if you just, the one variable model, per, perhaps overly simplistic, says, well, the market sure seems to be taking this as a quantitative easing program. Yeah, but then that's going to undo a lot of the, the good work that was done with their rate cuts that filter through to housing. Mm -hmm. So, Ed, what do you make of this? Uh, as you sit back and think about, you know, the operations that the, the Fed is, has undergone and you think about valuations and how that translates into the overall economy, um, it, does this allow the Fed to be successful in navigating to this greatest economy ever? <laughs> We already yeah. had the rosy outlook, so I just want to <laughs> right. bring in the greatest economy ever. So, um, you know, first thinking back over what we just discussed, uh, in, in hindsight, maybe people saw it contemporaneously, uh, the Fed made a mistake in, in late 18. Uh, and Jeffrey, like you're pointing out, it was pretty clear to market participants uh, at that point. Uh, I would assume uh, with the election that the Fed desperately wants to be on hold this year. Uh, and uh, on, on inflation, I think there's a risk that inflation picks up, but it's, it's just a risk. Uh, and so far, inflation doesn't look like it has a chance of getting up to their target, which would even begin to suggest they might tighten. Uh, are, you, you're, are you referencing the PCE? What, yeah, P, what the you say? P, because yeah, there's PCE many, board. many inflation indicators that are over 2%. Right. But I the, mean, but average hourly earnings are in a, a solid uptrend. They have been for a couple of years. Right. But I'm saying the, the, one, the one that they've uh, decided, yeah. say they're focused on. Yes, indeed. But, uh, and I find that uh, inflation outside the U.S. Uh, generally is coming down, like they got the Eurozone core CPI this morning. Uh, it was unchanged month to month and only up 0.3 year on year. Um, so uh, I look at uh, monetary policy in addition to this discussion on a global basis. And you know, other central banks are expanding their balance sheet. You still have very uh, low interest rates, negative interest rates. And I track uh, global short rates. Uh, they're down about 50 basis points, which for them is a pretty big decline. Uh, I, would, I would add to this discussion uh, the great- When you say global short rates down 50, down to what level? about 220 to, to 170. And a lot of the decline recently has been by the emerging yeah. uh, market central banks. Um, but what I would add here uh, is that the great Milton Friedman uh, coined the idea that uh, monetary policy works with a one and two year lag, which makes it difficult for them because they're trying to drive over here and it takes them a year or two to know if they made the right course correction. And so I have, uh, a strong uh, feeling that the economy this year will do better than expected because of what the Fed did last year. Uh, in addition, they you know, increased their balance sheet. And because it was said, uh, about the same time uh, they did the, the QE for the uh, repo market, uh, not only did bond yields go up, but stock prices went up in sort of a shot. Uh, and so you had a unusual increase in stock prices, uh, and consumer net worth is up over 10%. Uh, and so I, I think the, they're loading up the economy to do better, uh, particularly in the first part of 2020. So gi given that backdrop, and the, we all know that it does operate with the lag, who knows what that lag uh, time frame is. Steve, as a, as a equity investor, what do you make of Fed policy? And is that accretive to the equity markets today? Uh, does that, is it already baked into prices? How are you thinking about that? And do you even use, um, you know, central bank policy when thinking about equity valuation? Well, let me start by saying we're price takers. So we tend to respond to whatever price the markets give us and, and prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And don't make great determinations to what the Fed may or may, may, or may not do and how it might impact the, impact the markets over the near term. From, from where I sit, from where we sit, we look at it, you know, first, we don't think that the economy is, is quite as strong as people think. A lot of this growth has been bought through excess leverage around the globe. I mean, you have you know, sovereign you know, leverage that's increased, state and local leverage, underfunded pension plans. You have corporate leverage. I mean, Ed's point about the consumer you know, net worth growth, if you back out housing out of that equation, I mean, you've got 
you know, you know, credit card debt, you know, at a new high. You got auto loans, you know, at a new high. You got student loans at a new high, you know, in excess of a trillion dollars. And and it's scary. I mean, the average, the average. You talk about what the economy is doing and the benefit of rates and and somewhat accommodative policies. You've got the average new car loan is now at 69 months. You're looking at their at recent, you know, securitizations. The average used car loan is 63 months. And that's for a used car. It's already a few years old. So you're like still going to own this car for, right? right? You're still going to own this car in, eight, you know, it's going to be eight or nine years by the time that loan's paid off. So we look at this and, 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 and look at a lot of this policy and have a little bit of, you know, have, have great concern that there's a bunch of academics out there making these arguments that they hope will acclimize into reality and betting trillions of dollars in the process. And I can't help but, you know, you know fall back on, on playing Monopoly with my kids and look at the Monopoly instructions. It says that the bank can never go broke. The banker can, you know, print, you know, money as much as they want without any impact. And, you know, we'll... You know, we'll see if that's actually true. We believe there's going to be some impact in the future. You know, I don't know how to opine as to when that might be. It was much easier for me a decade ago. We were dealing with a subprime crisis, and we had a lot of debt that had to be refinanced, both at the individual level, housing that was, you know, you had teaser rates that, that had to uh, reset at a higher level. You had corporations that had to refinance. So we're, we're sitting in a place, I didn't mention the corporate leverage you know, before when I was going through my litany of, of leverage. We can come back to that later, later. So I don't know what keeps us all moving forward. I don't know what growth will, may, will mean. I do know that as an equity investor, given how the markets have run, it doesn't seem like a lot of this risk is discounted in the market or any of it. Yeah. So let's transition real quick uh, across the pond. So the ECB still has, um, you know, an extreme policy at the negative 50 base points. We saw the Reichsbank a couple of weeks ago get off of negative rates, got back to zero. Um, I see you cheering there, Daniel. Go Sweden. Yeah, uh, go Sweden. Uh, that's um, that's where the Reichsbank is. And so I, I think as we think about it, is there a chance for the ECB to reverse course? They're they're mired in QE. They have the this negative 50 basis point rate. They are the policy setters, really. Um, for the negative yielding market. They're the poster child there. Um, do they ever get off this? Is 2020 the year? Um, is there some semblance of fiscal policy coming to help rescue there? Or is it just going to be more of the same, hoping that this bad policy, as in my opinion, uh, continues just to work itself out? So maybe, Dave, you can start with that. Okay. Well, look, I, I think that um, hopes of there being some sort of a fiscal response uh, that's really gonna spin the dial. I, I put extremely low odds uh, on that happening. And we just finished talking about how the world is awash in debt right now, so somehow we're gonna throw more government debt at a time when the credit multiplier globally has never been as weak as it is today. Uh, I think that actually the answer for the global economy is at some point we have to go through, we could talk about this later, a global debt default. The problem is that there's too much debt and adding more to it is, is not gonna help. Okay, I'll be, I'm from Canada, I'll use an example. In Canada, we tried massive deficit finance in Canada under the Trudeau regime. The Canadian economy right now, in real per capita terms, is actually declining. Okay, so that's not the answer. I'll just go back to what Ed said earlier, inflation. I mean, what, what is finally the central bank's mandate? Okay, uh, they are moving further and further in the, in your, in, in, the, uh, in the euro area from their inflation goal. They have, uh, structural problems on the supply side, that much is true, but they have a chronic deficiency of demand. And part of that is because they have a dysfunctional banking system throughout. Uh, and I'm sure negative rates aren't helping, but the reality is that the European banks never recapitalized, never nearly stress tested to the extent that they did in the United States. And it's not as if things in the U.S. were great this cycle, but the U.S. is the best house in the bad neighborhood because the banks are in better shape. They're not in better shape in Europe. So how are you going to get a normal credit channel going to facilitate aggregate demand growth? So the truth is always in the price. What we know is that inflation is falling. And now 30 basis points, as per what Ed said earlier, from slipping in outright deflation. So I'm not going to say that negative interest rates, um, which carries with it all sorts of pernicious effects, but will they have to do more non-conventional? Will they have to get more aggressive, say, on QE? Um, I mean... What else can the central banks really do? Uh, ultimately, I think that if they can restore banking sector integrity and quality of capital, uh, that'll help out the European growth. But outside of that, what else can the ECB really do except more QE? Yeah, well, I, I did read an IMF paper over the summer uh, where they were talking, I think the title was something along the lines of enabling deeply negative interest rates in the next recession. 
And uh, I think I walked over to your desk, Jeffrey, and you're like, aren't we already deeply negative? Um, but the, the premise there was that you need to go to negative 400, negative fi 450, 500 basis points in the next recession. Is that plausible? Um, and what are the ramifications? So I think this is a Jim slash Danielle question here. Um, I'll start. Um, you can't go to negative 500. And I'll, and I'll tell you why you can't go to negative 500. First of all, um, when you go negative interest rates, something like $2.4 trillion of, um, of deposits in Germany right now, only 25% of them are being assessed a negative interest rate. And those are usually deposits of over 300,000 euros. Um, the reason that they go that way, they, the reason they've gone that route is if you have 300,000 euros in the bank, you're not gonna take it out and put it under your mattress. Right. If you have 2,000 euros in the bank, you might. So you're putting the bank structurally at a lost position. They're going to have a negative funding cost that they cannot pass along, so they are guaranteed a loss. You go five minus 500, you're going to basically drive them all out of business mm -hmm. is, is what you're gonna want. Or if you unleash the caps and allow them to start um, uh, assessing severe negative interest rates on their deposit bases, then you're gonna have a revolution in the streets that the banks are taking my money. Uh, they're taking my money in a serious way. So I don't see how they can do that. Now they could do a sleight of hand, which is sort of what uh, Draghi uh, proposed right at the end of September where they went to tiering. And what tiering is is that we're going to go minus 50, which is what they did, but then we're going to allow some banks to be exempted from the negative rate and be effectively allowed a zero rate. Uh, and so that's the sleight of hand they could do. The reason that, that it's going to be hard for them, though, in general, to get off of negative rates is, you know, you used the Hippocratic Oath a minute ago, they are like a doctor that they can never give up on the patient. You know, you never want a doctor who's going to say, eh, I've done all I can, just go over in the corner and die. I'm sorry, I can't do anything more for you. They will keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. So they can never say, well, the European economy is poor and we've tried negative rates and that's it, good luck, you know, and see how it goes. So they'll keep trying and they'll keep trying and they'll keep trying. And that's where that sleight of hand with um, depositoring could possibly come in. But that's not really helping the problem right now. So I just can't see how they can go to that degree of negative, especially with the dislocations that they would create as in the banking system, it would be too much. Um, it's, it's actually fascinating. The, 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 the study that you bring up was the first paper presented after Powell did his pirouette um, at, the, at a Chicago Fed conference, which was right after Neiman Marcus paper uh, priced and crashed the next day and junk bond issuance shut down for a week. So that was very late. Um, in, in the summer, and literally a few days later, Powell said, but what, what did he say instead of uh, effective, lower, effective lower bound? Was, right, right. Was replaced, of, and yeah. the verbiage changed, but I digress. Instead of zero, he went to effective. Um, I, I think that the problem that the ECB faces is that India is not ready, and I'm not trying to be cryptic, but it's not a, and I'm speaking in, in reference to German being this exporting powerhouse. Uh, you cannot re-urbanize China. And this is not just a shift from the internal combustion engine to electric vehicles. It's beyond that. It is a matter of that you've got this massive population that, that has been brought up and is largely purchasing price parity middle class now in China, but they're kind of saturated. So you cannot generate um, at the margin the level of demand needed. We have fresh data out uh, that shows that, that manufacturing is, is at a 25-year, 23-year low in Germany, you can't have the biggest engine of growth that has supported the other countries, such as Italy, who have who have broken balance uh, bank balance sheets. You cannot have any type of measurable demand if you don't rev that export engine of Germany back up, and you can't do that because India does not have enough mileage uh, of, of highways. It's simply inconceivable. India's trying, but again, this was a secular blowout move in the global auto sector that benefited half a Cadillac sales were in, in, in China. You cannot re-engineer that anytime soon. So if Lagarde is looking for underlying demand growth, good luck with her demographics, good luck with her banking system, and good luck with what's going on with Germans, Germany's exports. So, so Jeffrey, let, let's play a game here. Let's put you in charge of the ECB. 
What, what, what would the policy <laughs> response, or what would your response uh, function uh, I, be I here? Think, I think they need to play a longer game, and they are reluctant to do it because they don't want the short-term pain. I think one of the most telling charts that central bankers should be looking at is the performance of the banking sectors in the United States, Europe, and Japan going back for a long time. Now, Japan was the first zero interest rate place and negative interest rate place. Japanese banks, unbelievably, as a sector, the total return of, of bank stocks in Japan since 1985 is negative 81%. Negative 81%. So that's what the negative interest rates brought you, is a banking system on its knees. In Europe, we, we had interest rates that paralleled the United States into the, into the financial crisis, basically. And the banking sector in the United States and in Europe performed almost identically from 1995 into the crisis. Since they went negative and started these uh, policies in, in the ECB, the US uh, banking index is back to its highs. So there's no change in the banking index from its peak in, 19, uh, in 2007. The European banking system is down by about 90% over that time period, and it's basically still at its low. And so the obvious message is that these interest rates, and you would think almost an economics 101 student would understand this, that you are forcing a bankruptcy situation on these banking systems with negative interest rates. I met with a fellow who runs a big a Swiss insurance company, and he said, my life is a living hell because our definition of success is stretching out the timeline to the assured bankruptcy that we are facing, as long as these interest rates are negative. So I think what you need to do is get off of these policies that you think are helping you for the present calendar year, because you know that they're fatal in the long run. And there's a metaphor that we're living with in the United States, which is our debt situation, where it's sort of like, well, it hasn't been a problem so far, so it'll never be a problem. That's, that's become so, something of a mantra. But I, I kind of reject that logic. We're, we're now running deficits in the United States. The national debt is growing faster than nominal GDP, just at the, just at the, at the federal level. Forget about all the other stuff. So if we weren't growing the national debt, we wouldn't have any growth. So it's, it's quite clear that you're, you're playing this kind of a tractor pull game with the debt-based uh, economic scheme, as, as David said, the, the, the bang for the buck you get for every new piece of debt is, going, is, is fallen by a huge amount. I don't know exactly what the fraction is over the last 30 years, but it's gotta be like two thirds or something like that. So the, these, these policies, they, they seem like they're uh, designed to work in the short term, but they're fatal in the long term. So I think you have to get off of them. I mean. Uh, I mean, I remember I, was, I did a, a, a little conference where I was with Jim Grant, and somebody said, but if you were the chairman of the Fed, what would you do? And he said, I would shut the Fed down. <laughs> <laughs> and I, that's how, kind of what I feel about the, the ECB. What would I do if I, if I had the ECB? I would completely try to rejigger, but uh, obviously the political winds are not very supportive of that type of dramatic action. Right, so you, you'd mentioned- Only oh, Paul Volcker really did that kind of a thing. I had an addendum to what Jeff was talking about. You, you're right. If you look at Japan, who's done the most QE the longest, their banks have done the worst. Then after the financial crisis, Europe went heavily into QE and negative rates, and they've struggled. The U.S. only did QE and then stopped, and we went back to our highs. My addendum is, if you look at Australia and Canada, which have never done QE, have never engaged in um, uh, negative rates, their bank stock indexes are way through their old highs from 2007. And they've been performing in line with what you would expect stock markets to perform. So the further you get away from QE, the better the banking system seems to be. And at the top would probably be the Australian banking system right now. They've got nowhere near what we're talking about and their banks are doing much, much better, orders of magnitude better than everybody else. Yeah, so you mentioned the amount of uh, debt and it, it seems to be coordinated globally that it's just spending, spending, spending these big deficits. So Ed, what do you think about um, the unconventional policy of let's say modern monetary theory as people call it these days where the deficits haven't mattered so they won't matter going forward. H how do you interpret that and is that tenable uh, even in the medium term? So, uh, 
on the MMT, it's, uh, it's not modern. <laughs> it's not of theory, monetary theory. <laughs> and uh, It's at least money, right? <laughs> they at least got the M, one of the M's, right? So uh, they, I, should, I should add in here uh, that uh, China is, has cut their triple R rate by 500 basis points. Uh, and they're going to, uh, I think that includes, they're going to cut 100 this, this month. Uh, 150 they've already announced and there'll be another 50. Um, the, my, my view uh, of all these things is that they will come home to roost uh, when we get inflation uh, and significantly higher interest rates is my, so I, I know timing is everything. I'm just saying I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to go off too early because I, th I think that there's still a lot of room. Uh, we mentioned Australia. Not, I'm sure you're not making this point, uh, but Australia hasn't had a recession in 28 years. Right. Uh, and the, I travel constantly. Uh, they and, did that without QE at negative rates, too. We yeah. were going 28 years without a recession. Yeah. Uh, they also kind of had a, a small thing called China where they had the most resources <laughs> right. in the world they were delivering there, but you know, uh, right. fair enough. Right. So uh, on, I travel constantly and I'm always struck with how well local economies are doing. So I flew in here yesterday, looking down at Los Angeles, just going, wow, look at that place. And I don't know if you would disagree, Stephen or Jeffrey, but Los Angeles looks pretty strong. Uh, and Dave and I were talking about Toronto a second ago. He says a new growth spurt. And uh, now it's going to smaller places. So one, one of our analysts uh, just moved to Raleigh. There's a really nice place. Cost of living uh, is pretty low, and it's booming. Uh, they have Fortnite, Red, Red Hat, a uh, couple of sports teams. Uh, so uh, I wish you could come with me on my... <laughs> Uh, these are not exactly exotic places to visit. I've been to Raleigh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so I, th I think the uh, commies you know, made a lot of progress, particularly in the U.S., not so much in Europe. Uh, and on China, uh, I think there's something like, I, th I think the average income in China is something like $20,000 or $17,000. Because you have three, four hundred million people that basically make nothing. So it's still, it's still an emerging economy. Uh, to put it graciously or generously. And, uh, and maybe I should add in here, just in terms of timing. Uh, so obviously, uh, Trump has a reason for the economy to be better this year. And uh, Japan has the Olympics coming up as another sort of uh, factor. And then the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party uh, is in the summer of 2021. So she w would like to move into that, you know, on a favorable note. So you have three people that are, uh, in terms of what you guys are talking about, they're kicking the can down the road pretty hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so David, what do you think about the MMT? I mean, that, that's essentially what Ed's saying is going to happen here, not just in the U.S., but it's going to be this fiscal stimulus uh, just to keep juicing the economy with regard to the long-term consequences. Well, yeah, look, I, I think we've already addressed that. I mean, if it, what's the old saying? If it, if it walks like a duck, uh, you know, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. I mean, um, I guess that MMT was written in the context recently uh, to, you know, use the Fed's balance sheet to fund green energy and infrastructure, stuff like that. But We've been doing MMT already when you really think about it. I, I mean, we're debating whether or not there's been a QE or out, actually outright debt monetization by the quickness as to how fast the Fed's been buying these Treasury bills after they've been issued. So I guess if you're not buying it from the primary market and you're waiting 10 seconds to buy it in the secondary market, well, all of a sudden it's not debt monetization. Look, we're <laughs> in MM, we've been in MMT for a long time. We've also been doing okay, universal so it's, basic it's just, income. Uh, it, just not universal. We've been doing basic income for 50 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. kinds of yeah, it's, it, so so anyway, to me, to me, it's a moot point. Um, 
it's just a, maybe a new term for really a policy that's been in place. Uh, the one thing that I, I want to just mention, and probably maybe the biggest difference I have with Ed, is, is on the view on inflation. That's why we have uh, you on the opposite ends here. Well, because, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's a, uh, nothing like watching a couple of economists get into a mud fight, right? <laughs> So uh, the, the point I'll make is this, you know, I hear it all the time about, you know, that everybody believes inflation is just around the corner, and yet it's never really around the corner. And you can't just say, well, I think inflation is going to be going up. The question becomes, what's your supply-demand framework? Because the only use an economist has, if you're actually forecasting a price, is you have to know the shape and the direction of the curves that you're talking about. And so in this case, we're talking about globally. And actually, over time, this is why you know, people, for example, get it completely wrong when they see the Phillips curve. It doesn't matter anymore. The Phillips curve is comparing the unemployment rate and the inflation rate. The unemployment rate is still determined largely locally, but inflation over time, and I think Ed made this point, and this is one thing I do agree with wholeheartedly, which is that over the decades, inflation domestically is being influenced more and more by what's happening globally. So you're comparing the unemployment rate, which is local, to inflation, which is more global. Thing is, this is the first cycle ever, <laughs> and we're 10 years into this, and we've never seen a situation where the output gap globally, okay, that interrelation between aggregate supply and aggregate demand, the demand curve never crossed the ball across the supply curve. We never had the output gap close this cycle. And what we know with certainty is that the OECD leading indicator for all the prognostications of how great things are going to be next year that's right now flirting with its lowest level in 10 years. There is no global growth recovery. You don't have to have a recession view. Growth is going to slow below potential at a time when the output gap never closed globally, and that is going to foster an ongoing disinflationary environment at a time when we peak the cycle at inflation at a record low. I'm looking at the United States, for example. The peak in core inflation, we had a double peak. And I'm looking at core CPI, okay? 2.4%. Are you kidding me? You know, back when I was at Merrill, back in 2006, 2007, we peaked at 2.9. And I was saying back then, there was the lowest cyclical peak since we we're watching the Beverly Hillbillies uh, in the 1950s. That was the lowest cyclical peak since that time period. We've never peaked at 2.4 in any cycle since the 1930s. That was the peak, and the New York Fed leading inflation index started rolling over, what do you know, three months before bond yields peaked last year. So we peaked at the lowest level of core inflation on record, despite what, seven years of free money, repeated rounds of QE, a stock market that went up fivefold, three and a half percent unemployment, and let's throw on cost push from tariffs. And as Billy Joel would say, that's all you get for your money. We peaked at 2.4 and we rolled over. And so we're, we're, where are you going from here? And actually, if you read the FOMC minutes that just came out on Friday, there was a few participants concerned about financial imbalances. But when it said several, or it said many, or it just said participants, they are concerned about inflation going even further below target and inflation expectations remaining frustratingly low. And we can always talk about well, what should they care about where inflation is as long as it's positive, it's not negative. But of course, when you're talking about the debts where they are right now globally, you fall into an outright deflationary environment. You don't need to have rates go up. Inflation goes down, and that impairs the debt servicing capacity, and that's when you're going to get into a fallen angel situation here and abroad over the course of the next couple of years. That, that realization is probably what motivated Jay Powell to give what I think was the quote of the year for 2019 on, in late October. And it got some press coverage, but I don't think nearly enough. And the quote is, I think we would need to see a really significant move up in inflation that's persistent before we even consider raising rates to address inflation concerns. That is just pregnant with information because it obviously suggests that even though core CPI has gone above the 2%, that there's something uh, in the room that is disconcerting to, to the Fed's uh, framework of looking at the inflation picture. Right, well the core CPI is above two. Uh, but I, I think actually the best indicator, and this is for the people that think that, you know, the government statisticians are, are you know, with their imputations uh, are skewing the numbers lower. If you actually go to my favorite indicator, which is the market-based core PC deflator, which actually, because so much financial services, health services, imputed rents, actually the market-based core, which about three months ago was running at 1.7, is down to 1.4. 
And that's actually a great leading indicator for where the overall underlying inflation is going to be going in the next little while. But I think it's, as you said, because, you know, look, you make, you make your living. I mean, I'm an economist. We're all economists here. You're, you're, a, you're a market maker. That information that Powell gave you means that policy is, is completely asymmetrical, that they are yes. way more likely to be cutting rates mm -hmm. and going back to is <laughs> the lower, that, that, the lower that, that, bound than they're going to raise rates. I absolutely agree with right. you. And it, it, that's why it's, it's, it's so confounding as to how the framework, th this kind of idea framework changed over the past 13 months because he was asymmetric the other way 13 months ago. What's changed? Well, I, I have an answer to that, for, and I'll keep this short, but I found it part of the conversation we had before, when he came in in January 2018 at his confirmation hearing in the Senate, first thing he said is, we've been patient in raising rates, now we have to normalize. And the first thing the Fed did at his first meeting was they raised, collectively, their estimate of the neutral funds rate, and they ultimately went from two and three quarters to three. Oh, now they're, now they're down to two and a half, and they're going, to be going even lower. That's funny, right? We have to normalize interest rates. But what does that even mean? What is the normal interest rate in a completely abnormal economic recovery? Right. And so what he found out firsthand, what he found out firsthand was that normalizing interest rates in an abnormal economic recovery is no easy task. I think that where his fundamental mistake was from a, let's say, say from a, not a, so much a markets, but a macroeconomic standpoint, was they did a whole rethink. And this is again, I think that um, it was either Evans or Williams said this over the weekend, the whole rethink has been, where is this unobservable, neutral, mm -hmm. or normal interest rate? Because yeah. what they figured out is that it ain't 3%, yeah. and it ain't even 2.5. The R-star. And it might be the R-star, and, and the nominal R-star, by the way, might be as low as 1%, and there's still 50 basis points above there's, that. There's, there's real parallelism between that and the political environment, really. I mean, it's sort of like, we got to get interest rates back to normal. Normalized means normal. but. It's not normal. I mean, right. we don't know what normal is. And so now we have candidates that are still uh, kicking it, uh, from the establishment in the mainstream, like Joe Biden, saying what we need to do is get back to normal politics. <laughs> but normal politics just means reactionary types of nostalgia, right? <laughs> there isn't anything normal in the world ever, let alone when you have all of this shifting you know, power structure in the, in the geopolitical economy and, and, and inner workings of nations. So it's, it's strange how people cling to this notion that the genie can go back in the bottle. Well, I, look, I, I think the one person's name who's not been mentioned yet is Rich Clarida. And I, 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 Jim, Jim would probably agree with me, but I think Rich Clarida was determined to have a 1995-1998 episode where they were able to put the genie back in the bottle for a little while longer, inflating the biggest stock market bubble in U.S. history. But I think that, that part of, of Powell's adamance, part of why he is so insistent is because he's determined for this to be the mid-cycle adjustment that he said it was going to be, and that just means more QE. But if could it's, it's mid-cycle adjustment, could I, go ahead. Could I talk about inflation for a second? Dave, I don't want you to get off on this inflation with me, because uh, I am trying to turn bearish I want to turn bearish so badly. <laughs> uh, you got a good crowd. Huh? <laughs> you got a good crowd around you. I might turn bullish when you turn bearish. So. <laughs> well, we got, maybe, maybe we, we got to maintain these bookends, right? <laughs> so, uh, and so, you know, I've been writing uh, that inflation is the biggest risk this year, which I, I do think. I'm also aware that a lot of the inflation measures are already above two. Uh, but uh, as try, try as much as I can, I really have a hard time going there. Uh, they have a lot of measures of inflation, one of which uh, is a survey of consumers about inflation expectations, which cuts through a lot of things about your basket and whether you're paying a lot for school or health care, and that's making new lows all the time. It's what people see inflation coming down. Uh, so I'm trying to see inflation go up, but it's hard. And I've... Uh, I, grew up uh, really thinking the world of Milton Friedman. And I never had a chance to ask him, how do you know if excess money creates excess demand or excess supply? And now I'm thinking that excess money, easy money, is creating excess supply. They build buildings, new cars, new airplanes, and it's actually become slightly deflationary. Uh, now, I will say, uh, before, I, Jeff, I turn it back to you. I will say uh, that 
Uh, I've studied the big uh, mega bull markets, say like the 20s. 1925 to 1929, inflation was zero every year. And so a little bit like now, the Fed keeps trying to create inflation. They're not able to, so they create an inflation in the S&P or asset bubbles, maybe art prices or house prices, but anything but price of goods and services. That, that certainly seems to be the case. I mean, I think one of the reasons that consumers uh, that are surveyed have sort of record low inflation expectations is they haven't experienced any. True. I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, you pay your bills every month, and when's the last time you had a bill that really went up? I mean, yeah. uh, like, but, but like... I will say that you know, there was a period where every conversation as a practitioner would be that inflation is a lot worse than the CPI numbers. Inflation's not five, it's 10. Mm. How about the, your parking bill, your school, your health care? Yeah. That doesn't come up anymore because people have not seen much inflation. Maybe school. School probably has had it, pretty big inflation. Right, particularly Dart Dartmouth. But <laughs> and, and, and that's that, private. That, that number that you, um, I mean, that was the University of Michigan, which is about 70 year series. And, and who would have thought that with the stock market booming, all the financial inf inflation, the asset inflation, that it would have been last month that we would have had. The University of Michigan, <laughs> median five, 10 year hitting a new all time low. Of I would, I would it's think never that's, been that low before. That's the reason it's happening. You have no inflation. So central banks keep pumping, 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 and they're getting an asset bubble. But, but you know, what's interesting once again, and actually if you modeled this out, I mean, I mentioned the output gap before because you have to have a supply demand framework. But uh, inflation expectations are arguably statistically the biggest driving factor for future inflation. And I'd say that that was all over the FOMC minutes that came out on Friday. Mm -hmm. And here you have, for whatever reason, and, and yet yeah, it's interesting because, you know, since um, early October when the Fed did this uh, new round of quantitative easing, let's go to the bellwether M2 measure of money has ballooned yeah. at a 12% annual rate, 12%. Yes. Uh, and, 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 and yet, What's interesting is that when you go to the bank lending data, CNI loans <laughs> have contracted at a 2% annual rate. Yep. So we have a big dichotomy here uh, between what's happening, say, in the real economy and what's happening, again, in the financial economy, because, of course, that excess liquidity has found itself, what do you know, in the stock market. So I think that that's actually, uh, you know, something that we also have to consider is this in the inflation is what does that credit contraction mean? And it's part of the, uh, when you talk about Milton Friedman, which is really the Fisherian identity, MV equals PY. And you can have all the money supply growth in the world, but if the velocity of money is going down, and actually velocity of money year over year is collapsing, and actually the level of M2 velocity hit a new all-time low last month. So you can create all the money in the world and stash it in the garage, but if it doesn't turn over, you don't get any inflation. And the big story in the inflation is the velocity is contracting right now at an alarming rate over the course of the past few months. Yeah, can I, just, so, just, somehow that seems to tie into Jim's statement about the overregulation of banks. Yeah, it, it, it really does. Um, I was just sitting here thinking, and I wanted to throw out a question at the end points here. Uh, the Amazon effect, technology, the change in business plans, disruptive uh, businesses. Uh, how much of that is putting a lid on any type of inflation? The ability to substitute right now in the economy, I think, is unparalleled. You got a Chinese supplier and you're unhappy with your Chinese supplier, quick Google search and a Skype call, it doesn't cost you a penny, and you're well on your way to getting a Vietnam supplier. Uh, you know, think about what the effort was to try and do that 30 years ago. So, Ed, is technology really... Uh, a driving force behind holding this down? Are we changing business models that are just uh, making it almost impossible to raise prices? This has been going on for about 20 years. Mm -hmm. And well, we haven't had inflation for about 20 years. That's yet. what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. And so one factor is technology. Mm -hmm. Another factor is globalization. Another factor is intense competition. And those things, depending on the industry, have been holding back inflation. Uh, and as a sidebar, uh, I think that easy money is intensifying intense competition. Yes. Because you can build a building, uh, new cars. Uh, Companies plant. that should be out of business, mm -hmm. right. there was not free money, right. are, pr are producing stuff. 
you're, you've created zombie companies. Yeah. And I Jim mean, does a great job of tracking the exact percentage yeah. of zombie so, companies out there, and it's at a record high. So I will, I will, uh, I don't want to get into sophistry, but uh, there's the Marshallian K. You talk about velocity. It says it's really bad, it's going down. The Marshallian K says that if money growth is faster than the economy, that money growth has to go somewhere. You could go into paintings, houses, Stocks. stock market. Stock market. Uh, and so, whereas I, I'm a contrarian at heart. And declining velocity to me is like the best thing there is because there's money left over for financial assets. Now, if you're unemployed, uh, scratch this Not conversation. So good. Yeah. Not so good. <laughs> you want the economy to grow faster. Yeah. Uh, but we're in a situation, and I, I'd forgotten about the, this to mention for us that the money supply has accelerated so much just recently. And the uh, economy may be picking up some, whether it is or not, it's not growing 12% or, or seven or whatever. Four or five. Yeah. So I think from here, we wanna take this discussion into the implications for markets. So we've been talking about central banks and kind of the broad macroeconomic uh, picture. Before we do that, let's take a break. Mm -hmm. 